I ended the previous part of this video by asking you to match these things to whether they are examples of primary energy, secondary energy, or energy services. So let's do that. Coal is something we dig up out of the ground, and so that makes it primary energy. Kinetic energy of a car, though, is the end result of a whole lot of energy transformations, and it's essentially the goal of a bunch of them. That's an energy service. The sunlight incident on a field, again, is a naturally occurring thing, and so that is primary energy. A tank of diesel fuel started out as crude oil, but has been processed into a more convenient form. That's secondary energy. The same goes for the electricity produced by a natural gas power plant. We've burned a primary energy source, natural gas, to produce electricity. Thermal energy in the air of a house is a service. It's one of the things you want from your energy. The energy stored in a battery in an electric car is just like a tank of diesel fuel, and so that's another secondary energy. Before moving on, I just want to point out a few things that are not on this diagram, and this is not a criticism. Uh, the diagram is plenty complicated already, and the makers of the diagram at some point had to decide what was going into it and what wasn't. But the first thing is that there are no losses shown in the production of oil products, and these are chemical processes, so there have to be losses there, and often Sankey diagrams like this will show those losses. The other thing is look at the agriculture box. And this is pretty normal for energy flow diagrams. It's showing inputs of oil and natural gas and electricity. And the outputs, actually, if you look into what they include, are things like moving farm machinery around and heating farm buildings. What is not included deliberately is the enormous input of solar energy in the form of sunlight falling directly onto fields and pastures and the rather large flow of energy in the form of food to people. But it is normal to leave those out of this. With the remainder of this video, I'm going to, in about five minutes, attempt to summarize all the main fundamental issues to do with human energy use. This is a ridiculous goal. There's no way I can really pack a good summary into five minutes, but we'll see how I do. So, right now, the dominant source of energy worldwide is, you will be unsurprised to hear, fossil fuels. What that means is that of the roughly 584 exajoules of energy that humanity used in 2019, about 492 exajoules was from fossil fuel sources. That's about 84%. That is what I mean when I say dominant. The next thing I want to point out, though, is the difficulty in estimating things like this. And that really, here they're giving four significant figures in the BP Statistical Review of World Energy. I'm very dubious that this is a number that we can know to four significant figures. For example, there are going to be plenty of countries with very poor data collection. Anything on the uh, failed states index, places like Yemen and Syria, likely are unable to collect and report this data. Uh, similarly, there are uncooperative countries, I'm looking at you, North Korea, that probably simply do not report these numbers even if they do collect them. But there's another thing going on here as well that's seriously missing, and that is an accounting of what's called traditional biomass. So throughout the developing world in, in particular, just burning wood, burning dung, and things like that is a major source of energy, and it's extremely difficult to estimate just how much energy people produce that way, but it is maybe 6 to 7% of the global energy consumption. The big issue, of course, is climate change, and I'm not going to belabor this point because if you're in this course, I'm speaking to the choir right now. So I'll just say we know CO2 levels in the atmosphere have been going up and it is having an effect on the climate and it is because primarily of our emissions as humans. But climate change is just one of many issues to do with the way we generate energy. So I don't know how you feel about the UN or particularly about how effective the UN is, but here are the UN's 17 sustainability goals. 
And however you feel about the UN, I hope you look at these goals and accept that they are worthy goals. Well, two of them are pretty much entirely about energy. But if you look at the rest and recognize that energy is extremely coupled with economics and with environment, there are quite a few of the other sustainable development goals that are very heavily influenced by energy. And then even the rest, because they often have to do with health, which is coupled with economics, and gender equality, for example, has uh, dependence on energy supply because in many parts of the developing world the primary task of gathering wood falls to women and so most of these goals are influenced by energy supply. Another really important factor that we need to consider when we're thinking about global energy supply is secondary energy. So a lot of the focus tends to be on say replacing coal plants with windmills and so on which is all very worthy. Um, but secondary energy is extraordinarily important, particularly because of transportation. And so to put it simply, I'll say that it won't matter if all our electricity is generated by wind if all of our cars still run on petroleum. So greenhouse gas emissions are important to think about. Primary secondary mix are important to think about. Availability is often crucial. So for example, geothermal energy is excellent. However, it's only available in large quantities in very selected locations. Natural resource needs also need to be considered. So for example, this map is showing availability of various key elements needed in production of batteries. Land area requirements. And we don't just need to think about land required for windmills and solar panels and power plants. We also have to consider the mines and the factories and so on that are involved in building, supplying, and so on of all of those things. And human health is important. So I talked about traditional biofuel. Um, that has big impacts on lung health throughout the developing world. And I'm showing a nuclear symbol here because it's what a lot of people worry about a lot. But far, far more people die because of respiratory ailments that uh, are directly traceable to burning of fossil fuels than are killed by nuclear accidents and so on. This is, of course, by no means a complete list. I haven't even mentioned economic viability, water use, and a whole lot of other factors. I'm going to finish off by asking a few questions, because a lot of the time when we're picturing the future, we tend to assume that in the future, at some point, the goal is that everyone is going to live something like the way a North American does now. Well, if that were the case, can we provide enough energy for that to happen, and can we do it sustainably? And what do we even mean by sustainable? How do we measure that? But that's a supply side question, and there are equally or possibly even more in important questions on the demand side. Can we decouple economic growth from the growth of energy use? Because the North American lifestyle is dependent on economic growth. And if we can't, then we're going to have to constantly grow our energy use, and that may not be possible. If we can't, um, in that case, if we decide that we have to stop economic growth, can we still have good living standards without economic growth? And ultimately, is the North American lifestyle that currently exists even possible to sustain, whether it's a worldwide thing or just North America? And of course, there are huge equity issues here. We cannot, in any good conscience, decide that one part of the world has a right to live in one way and everyone else doesn't.